Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Um, welcome to Social Media Fridays on Monday, episode 100. Uh, each week we meet here to talk about what happened last week in, in the world of uh, social media. With us tonight, uh, we have David Rosam, a uh, copywriter of 30 odd years standing in SEO for 12. You can find David at writingforseo.org. So in the Netherlands, uh, oh, David is located on the southernmost portion of England. And uh, in the Netherlands, uh, Edwin Jonk yeah, is CEO of Ida's Toast. Um, he's also a uh, um, an on-page uh, search engine optimizer. And uh, Edwin can be found at idesthost.nl, I-D-E-S-T-H-O-S-T dot N-L. And Masataki Wasa is CEO of uh, wasaweb.net. Um, he's also a Google Top contributor on the uh, AdSense community. Um, Masataki can be found at W-A-S-A-W-E-B dot N-E-T. Tim Kappa is uh, CEO of uh, onlineownership.com. He's also a Google Top contributor in the uh, Google My Business community. It was Tim Kappa that put uh, Corby on the map uh, before Tim Kappa. Nobody knew that Corby was 27 miles north of London. All right, um, let's uh, have a look at uh, our items tonight. And uh, we have uh, three, but let's uh, put the third question uh, up last because it's a long one. Um, so let me skip to, or let me just tweet that first. Let me skip to number two, which is, uh, this is the second time this has happened, uh, a Brazilian judge uh, has ordered WhatsApp blocked, affecting 100 million users. Another assault on net neutrality. Any comments on this? Uh, that, that's uh, twice that they've done that, making China look uh, tame by comparison. No. Yeah, it's the second time, and I think it um, went dark for 24 hours or something, not the full 72 hours. Um, basically, what happens uh, was that they wanted information from um, from criminal. Uh, from memory, I think it was uh, a drugs criminal or uh, drugs related, and um, WhatsApp refused uh, to give that particular uh, data or information, and the judge uh, they had to pay fines, and and once uh, they paid those fines, um, they still wouldn't give. Uh, the authorities, the information they requested. So then the judge um, said that they had to close WhatsApp. Um, it wasn't for everyone in Brazil. It was for about 100 million users. Um, and it, I think it depended on which um, uh, network you were on. Yeah. Uh, the carriers... Uh, Oh, go ahead, Master Taki. Uh, I was just going to say, it's a very blunt instrument to use, isn't it? Mm. Yes, mm. yes. But they wanted some sort of uh, information, which is pretty, yes. pretty specific. And in order to get that, they are willing to inconvenience 100 million people. Yeah, and especially in Brazil, it's it's um, uh, WhatsApp is quite popular in Brazil, uh, mainly due to uh, texting. Uh, in Brazil, people have to pay for texting, uh, not like in the United States, um, 
So uh, a lot of people are on WhatsApp because that's free, right? It, uh, it goes over uh, uh, Wi-Fi. So that's quite quite a large impact for users. Um, but still, if 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 this uh, if information is being asked by the authorities, uh, you will refuse uh, to give that particular information. Um, I don't I don't know what else they can do. Right? WhatsApp isn't shouldn't be more powerful than. So the, then the government, right? Well, I hope I the, judge, go on, the government, or well, the government isn't the judge. Um, no, 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 but, but they requested that. Does uh, legal system work? I don't know. Come to think of it. No, I don't know either how uh, uh, the legal system in Brazil works. But if one company uh, basically uh, is denying the rule of law in 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 the country, then what what else can you do than to black it out, right? I mean, if it's a legally constituted court asking for information um, according to the law, then companies would normally comply. Yes, yes. All right, have we covered this one? I think so, yeah. Okay. Let's go to the next. This one, people are uh, accusing Snapchat of ripping off an artist's portrait for a filter um, in what seems like an accident. Uh, um, Snapchat um, have used somebody's work and uh, they were very apologetic. Yeah, it looks quite similar, uh, the filter and the arts work, if you put it side by side. Um, it is pop art, so <laughs> it does look quite similar, right? Uh, especially the, the little bit that yellow uh, under the eyes are quite similar to the filter on uh, Snapchat. Um, I think they removed the, the filter, or what did they do? Mm. Yeah, they. If you put them side by side, they do look <laughs> very similar. And of course, there'd be hundreds of others that. Um, Will uh, they'll be getting away with? Um, yeah. Um, anyway, plagiarism. Yeah, and they, and they, they they removed the filters. That's that's basically what they did. Mm. That's really cute. That Snapchat. Um, um, my grandchild um, um, just loves it. Uh, just loves it. Um, and. Um, yeah, anyway, uh, forget me, I'm waffling. All right, well, look, let's go back to um, number one, our question number one, which um, was, uh, you know, it's the real meat in the sandwich tonight, um, an article um, from Masataki on um, a subject that everybody should be concerned about, uh, and that is defamation on, on social media. Um, and I thank Masataki because you uh, wrote that article and it made me read the entire um, the entire article um, um, on, on the judgment, the, the entire judgment. And uh, 
um, you know, being time poor and old and, and tired. Uh, I wouldn't normally do that, but I thank you for it because I, that was very, very interesting. Anyway, um, comments? Well, basically, it is, it is quite a normal case. Uh, they're, they're neighbors and they fight over noise and over a waterfall and a dog, of course. And um, then the, the uh, and the defendant uh, uh, basically brought it to Facebook and made some un untrue stories about uh, her neighbor that were damaging to him. So it's it's quite a normal case in the sense that it's neighbors that are. Uh, They don't like each other. <laughs> yeah, I think in this case the um, untrue remarks are very um, nasty um, in that the content of that defamation, defamatory remarks, was that the claimant, the plaintiff, the person who had been defamed, uh, was a pedophile, and he's a school teacher, so that really, you know, that really causes a huge amount of damage um, to his reputation and to his ability, in a sense, to teach at teach at school, and the principal, so the headmaster of the school, so that. Even if allegations are not substantiated, mm -hmm. even if they're untrue, allegations alone may dissuade schools from hiring people, hiring, you know, otherwise good teachers, but you know, have had some sort of you know, unfounded, unsubstantiated allegations made against them. Schools probably wouldn't take the risk of hiring people. Um, yeah, and so it also it also affected uh, his job, right? Uh, but he has to be more careful uh, when, or at least he finds uh, that he has to be more careful uh, when um, when teaching uh, the children, right? Yeah. He's a music teacher, so there is a bit of physical contact, you know. So yeah, if yeah. you're teaching musical instruments, then you know it might be your your fingers, you know, how you place them on a musical instrument and things like that. So it's quite natural for uh, teachers to say, "Look, this is how you do it. How you hold the instrument, or this is where you, you know, um, put your fingers, and so forth." And he's now very wary of doing that, even though there's absolutely no truth in the allegation. Just because that that um, allegation had spread and had been read by so many people, he doesn't know how many people have had read. You know, have had access to that message. Um, so he's now been very careful. His career prospects are limited now because of this. And I think he says that he has lost his love for teaching. I mean, he used to love his job, but now he really doesn't anymore. So you know, it's really damaging stuff. It's really nasty stuff um, for the plaintiff to claim it. Um, the interesting thing for me was that um, he sued the neighbor who made the, all these uh, false statements, and he managed to hold her liable for what she posted on Facebook, but also the defendant was made liable for the shares. So p other people sharing the original post on Facebook to their timeline. She was liable for those as well. And she was liable for the third party comments made to her post in response to her original post. Uh, 
and I think the problem is that I think this is a slightly extreme case, but there, you know, there must be a lot of conflict being played out on social media today, right? Yes, yes. Um, and it, so, it, 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 it it started uh, uh, in real life where the dog was on the property uh, of the plaintiff and there was a waterfall that made a lot of noise uh, during sleeping hours. Um, yeah. So the jump there is that on social media it's so easy for the message to spread. I mean, just think about this. Before social media, before the internet, if you like, okay, two neighbors have disagreements, they dispute, they have disputes over something. One of them is really being nasty and then try to spread false rumors. Obviously, it's possible to even have false rumors by you know, word and yeah, but it'd be very difficult for the person to actually write something up, then print numerous copies of that and distribute it everywhere. Whereas with social media, you don't have to do that. You don't have that physical, you know, printing presses, paper, ink, distributing them all over the place. You just can do that online, and you can reach a huge number of people. This person had, I think, over 2,000 friends, and she posted it publicly. So, you know, friends of friends might have seen it. People who are local might have seen it. It's impossible to know how many people have seen that. And it's the speed and it's the breadth of um, propagation that's quite new, I think. Yeah, the judge um, did an auto no test, right? Uh, that she yeah. has had to know that that the uh, the post that she created publicly, uh, without any privacy settings, uh, could be shared and um, uh, comments could be made, etc. Right? Yeah. So I think it, it, it's obviously legally difficult to say why, because I'm not a trained lawyer. Um, it is. I'm not 100 percent sure what the legal position is, but if you post something that's untrue, libelous, slanderous, uh, defamatory on social media. And um, the assumption is, and if you do so publicly, you haven't uh, restricted sharings and so forth, then the assumption is that you have intended for the bro broadest possible dissemination of that message. And you are liable for the spread of that message on other people's walls, timelines, streams, feeds. Uh, and the total damages were um, for, uh, 65,000 uh, US dollar, I think. Canadian, yeah, no? Yeah, yeah. Canadian. Uh, so you can always argue whether that's sufficient for the amount of damage that the plaintiff had suffered. I mean, I think it was so serious, it was so bad. Um, I'm not sure whether that's an adequate amount. But, but, you know, people might not think too much about what they post. They might be angry or they might just feel they have a moment of where they're a bit mad. And they decide, oh, yeah, I'm going to write something nasty about this person who annoyed me today. Post. It spreads, you know, you get likes, you get shares, you get everything, and now you are no longer in control of it, but you're still liable for it. So yeah, this, this, um, a couple of months back, we had, the, uh, we had a lawyer uh, that uh, sued someone for a fake review. Yeah. Um, I think this is, this is much more damaging. Um, the, 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 the plaintiff uh, was clearly, clearly uh, being damaged here, uh, online and offline, of course. That's yeah. 
I think that's the issue with this one. This one, there's a big overlap between the real life connection. Yeah, because they're neighbors, they live in the same local area. Um, they must know, they must have common acquaintances. You know, there's the overlap of people that they know. Um, so the, the conflict started in real life, if you like. It extended into the online world. That then sort of came back, as it were, to the real, to the real world, causing huge damage. I remember the, the lawyer case, which was essentially about someone being paid Fiverr to write fake review, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And and that person. So the fake review was in Britain, was in yeah. somewhere up north. Um, and the law firm was in in the states. I think it was in Colorado Springs, if I'm not wrong. And I mean, in that sense, there's no link, real life link. You know, the the fake reviewer had absolutely no real life connection, as far as as far as we could see, um, with the law firm. And the law firm had to go through hoops. So you know, it was more difficult in that sense because. They had to go to a court in the States, force disclosure, I think, so that, so that they knew the identity of the person who posted that fake review. And then they sued in England and Wales. I mean, for most people, that's not going to be an easy thing to do. That you, no. you know, um, I think that could only happen, that only happened because it was a lawyer. <laughs> and I think you have to be pretty pretty stupid to, you know, take on to do <laughs> write fake reviews about lawyers because they will know how to pursue you. Um, so that was a sort of a, a, a very different case and, and different, yeah. very different in nature. Um, it was, it was it, also a teenager. Um, I think when he wrote that fake review, he was 19, so... Yeah. Uh, well. uh, he was over 18 then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's true. That's true. Uh, but there's a difference between uh, uh, an adult and an. Uh... Yeah. So the problem is that you know we're going. This is not going to be an isolated case. There are going to be more and more cases like this. You know, it might be the fake reviews. It might be some defamatory remarks on Facebook or Twitter or Google. Plus, Instagram, wherever you care to think, it's entirely possible. Um, so, and then, how are you going to deal with it? In this case, because they're neighbors, it was easy to identify the person who's defaming you. But what happens if it's anonymous? Then you have to go, or you know, they have people have tried to hide their tracks. Then you have to go and discover who's behind the pseudonym or anonymous um, front, and then pursue them further. You have to establish that it's actually them who have posted these things, and so and so forth. It's not easy. I mean, you know, it's so easy to make these defamatory remarks now, and it can spread so quickly. Yet, if you are the defamed party, then you might face an uphill abs you know, struggle to stop the spread of the remarks in the first place, and then trying to sue the person that was defaming you. And it's going to be more and more difficult, I think. And do you know if the plaintiff went to the local authorities first, or is, is there no mentions? Um, because in this, this case is where neighbors... Uh, yeah, it's a yeah. Most most of the time they do call uh, the police, right? Like, uh, yeah, they did. Um, so the police arrived and actually, um, I think, saw the messages as well. And then police had been called before by the plaintiff and his wife because um, either because of noise. Um, at one time, I think the defendant had let off a quarter stick of dynamite. And it's part of the party. Seems a bit weird. And I think uh, they made the plaintiff and his wife made complaints to the local to the local authorities about a dog 
because the you know, gardens are not sort of fenced off. So you know, dog used to wander in, food, and went back. Um, and I think that it was either the local authority or the police um, that advised them to take pictures as evidence. So yeah, the local authorities and the police were involved, um, but obviously there's only so much they can do. Yeah, yeah. If uh, if this is about noise, they know what to do. But if this is about Facebook, they normally don't know what to what to do, right? That's uh, yeah. Yeah, I think but there was no mention uh, of the Facebook post in connection with local authorities or. No, no. So as far as I know, um, and I think the post was deleted by the by the defendant because I think she must she must have realized that the things were getting out of hand. Um, yeah, yeah. So I don't think the plaintiff went through the if you like the Facebook system of reporting the post and um, having it removed. I'm not so sure whether he had done so. It's not clear. It doesn't. It's not mentioned clearly in the judgment. Um, so we don't know. But yeah, it's going to be difficult because you know, if you defend what's the, what the, what's the priority, is your priority to get that message offline as quickly as possible, off the platform? So then you, know, you try to report it to, the, you know, report it to Facebook or to Twitter. You know, and then it's good if they respond in reasonable time to remove that. But what they say, what if, um, what if they say, you know, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Google Plus or whatever, if they say, ah, we can't remove this, then it becomes you know, really tough. And you you somewhat mentioned it in the beginning of your article, is that if you go to court. Those records will be public, and your name will be in those, and will be on the internet, right? Mm -hmm. um, so then you basically make it much bigger, uh, potentially, uh, than it was before, right? I think because now it, it is in the, in the, now uh, Google uh, index it, can search it, and your name. Uh, does come in connection with, in this case, uh, pedophile, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it is not. Um, it's not a. You know, it's it's not. It's not great. I, mean, I can't think of any other way of putting it. it it's I mean, if you're the deferring party, it's really really nasty situation to be in. You know, you don't want anyone to be in that situation because. No, from the plaintiff's side, right? Yeah. Exactly. Somebody, uh, somebody is uh, um, is the uh, defaming you, and yeah. and then you have to go to court. It will be public again. Uh, all, all the messages will be uh, indexed and searched, right? Um, so yeah. that's that's quite quite a step to go to go to court, and knowingly uh, that. Um, the story will probably never be removed, and your name and uh, the defamation will be connected. Yeah, I mean, you don't have the right to be forgotten in Canada. No, no, not in Canada. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a big, big problem. But at least there's a judgment that says, you know, this is a defamation case. The person has been defamed. So, you know, if, if people do read it, then it's quite clear what happened. Um, you know, do you take them you know, in other cases? Then do you take the calculated risk of just leaving those remarks be, and then you know, try to do online you know, reputation management? Um, yeah, yeah. So and it's reporting the, the, the reporting the posts uh, to Facebook, right? Yeah. And um, as I mentioned in that article, I do think Facebook does a reasonably good job of informing you about reports. Um, compared to say Twitter or Google Plus, Facebook would, would acknowledge that you've submitted a report, 
then they would say it's in review. And once they make a decision, they will inform you what they've done. Yes. Which you, which you don't see in Twitter or Google+. Plus. I mean, Twitter's no. pretty useless. Yeah, uh, Twitter is quite, quite annoying with that. Facebook is pretty good with That's a good system. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think that's a very the, good system. The, yeah, there, there are some false positives like we had before with, uh, uh, with the naked woman that <laughs> gave birth. <laughs> yeah, and there was a dog, wasn't there? Oh, and talk. Oh. Yeah. I think it was a golden retriever, and that looked like genitals. Oh. oh. Right. Have we talked this one through? I think so. Yes. Yeah. Do we have any other items of general business? Just got to tell you a little bit more about Tim Kappa, but I'll I'll save it for the green room. All right, um, we have two viewers uh, watching us, uh, and we thank you for that. Your interest in what we do makes uh, what we do worthwhile. We'll be back at the same time next week to do this all again, but.